Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Hammer City Games, currently developing Earth After Death, the one and the one and only Brendan Carlson. How you doing today, man? I'm uh, I'm a bit sick, but I'm recovering. How about you? I'm doing good. I was un I was under the weather for about a for about a week, but I'm finally past it, so I feel your pain, man. Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> so obvious well, Earth After Death, as I, under as I understand it, is a post-apocalypse survival affair. But we'll we'll get into that in a minute. I've got I have some building up to that to get to first, because one of the traditions with every newcomer here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Ooh, uh, I suppose my first introduction to things was picking up a 5th edition manual in 2014, I want to say, with some friends playing in there, playing in my friend's basement and rolling dice, shit like that. Um, it was fun, uh, definitely, you know, scratched an itch I didn't know I had before, I'd always been kind of interested in Dungeons and Dragons and RPGs and whatnot, but... I had absolutely no knowledge base to go off of. Um, but with that, I kind of launched into it, and I've found myself constantly circling the drain, so to speak, of the DM's chair, which I honestly don't mind. I prefer to run rather than play. And then uh, and then it was around 2018 when a friend introduced me to uh, every other RPG, in which I was like, oh my god! And... Uh, Needless to say, I have a pretty thick bookshelf of 40, 50 ish games now. Um, fifth edition is no longer among them, as I've uh, learned to hate what originally got me into the game. Uh, it's it's like a drug addict realizing that they hated alcohol all along. Um, and ever since then, I've just been looking for the weird and the wacky, the esoteric, and uh, above all, the the fun games to to run, play, and really dive into mm -hmm. so with her with um earth after death you are you, this is a post-apocalyptic affair which you have cited as being somewhat of a successor to gamma world but, and also taking some cues from wasteland and fallout um, absolutely so i'll start i'll start with Ga i'll start with gamma world um what was your first introduction to Ga to Gamma World? Which version of it? Because that game has gone through many system changes over the decades. Uh, just a, a, a bit of a <laughs> statement here. My first introduction to Gamma World was through Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons. And therefore, the only Gamma World I recognize in my mind is TSRs. Um, sure, I guess in quotations, TSRs existed for a while. Uh, publishing up until 7th, but after 2nd, I was just like, alright, I don't know what this is about, but this is not the same humble beginnings as, you know, these these games originally had. Um, my first introduction was after I, I delved into AD&D, and I really learned to love the dungeon crawl, and then branching off to read TSR's other games and looking at the weird list of mutations and... and um, the rule sets and whatnot they had in there, which I thought was great. And then I really went into the the more weird startup apocalyptic RPGs, like Aftermath and Exodus, which is basically a Fallout RPG, but they lost the rights. Um, and so definitely 1E is what I'm basing a lot of my inspirations off of. But more often than not, it's about 50-50 between AD&D and, and Gamma World, where I'm getting ideas for the hex crawl and the, the dungeon crawl from rules from both, and trying to merge them together in a way that makes sense, but also has sensibilities so that it, you know, it runs well. It's not just, all right, let me look up three different matrices so I know what number to roll for. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm guessing when you when you're saying that you're emulating Fallout, I'm assuming you're referring to the first two. Oh. Absolutely, yes. Uh Fallout One, uh, as a YouTuber I've seen before, has referred to it as the uh, the crack cocaine of video games is one thousand percent just the most distilled computered a computerized version of a tabletop game and I really fell in love with it after getting into the series with Fallout Three and then going backwards originally as my, you know, stupid fifteen year old brain, I was like, Oh, it's not in first person but as soon as I really understood the complexities and the writing and the systems, I was like, This is magnificent hmm. and and I really wanted to see something recapture that isometric and, and weird and wacky and also the systems they had were just wonderful. Everything just made sense. And because of, because of the fact that when, whenever somebody's designing a game to emulate a certain genre or the like, there's it's ne it's never just one or two entries that get that get studied. There's a but there's a bunch that get looked into, and I do see the um, that short list that you have on the Kickstarter of a few post apocalyptic um, affairs. There's there's a co there's a couple others that I did want I did want to ask if you had. At least, at least studied during the development of Earth After Death. The big sure, one, yeah. the big one for me to ask about is the Metro series. Yes, Metro has a special place in my heart. I discovered the books before the video games. Um, controversial opinion to anyone who has read the series. I love Twenty Thirty Four more than the original or the third book in the trilogy. It speaks to me on a narrative uh literature level but from the video game standpoint yes i adore the bleak russian despair which is just rife within their uh literary community mm -hmm. and the systems there especially with um uh that from that series i took a lot of inspiration when it came to ammunition management and even the inclusion of gas masks to deal with radiation uh which comes with bonuses and negatives, but I tried to make it so that it integrates well with the other systems, but doesn't become like a whole cumbersome thing that's going to ruin immersion or play. Mm -hmm. Though, an interesting thing when it comes to the Metro series is um, the big ins You're probably familiar with some of this, but the big inspiration was just Dmitry Glukowski's um, explorations through the Metro network in Moscow. And the, the because of the numerous layers and the ceiling of certain of certain areas, he started to view it as the world's largest nuclear bunker. And mm -hmm. around the time, he was also playing Fallout, and that's what got him to start writing it. Originally, no publisher wanted to touch it, so he started putting up chapters online and editing it based on feedback he got from readers. I do remember this very well, yeah. I remember he originally had Archim die, and then he was just like, oh, no no one liked that. I guess I'll have to rewrite it. And the reason the video games went in a different direction, kind of, is because he decided that Metro 2034 didn't lend itself to a video game script. Oh, it absolutely does not. It, no way does it. It's way too introspective. Way too. It's a bit too, it's a bit too introspective, and also, I think... From what I recall, 30, 20, 2034 kind of um, goes goes into goes into multiple perspectives. I may be missing. Yes, it does. Um, no, no, you absolutely right. It does. It goes through Homer and it goes through uh, Hunter and it goes through that girl that they rescue mm -hmm. uh, with within like the first third of the book. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I could go on and, and loud about how much I love that but, book, but yeah, but that's not here nor there, yeah. But he was also very hands-on when it came to the development of the of the games because he seems to have, he seems to have a higher he seems to have a higher under, um, respect for video games as storytelling medium, unlike some Eastern European authors I could I could mention, <clears throat> Andre, <clears throat> sorry. Need to work on that cough. <laughs> yeah, I, ha I have to take my shots at the at the writer of the Witcher books, if if only because he's kind of an asshole towards video video games as storytelling medium. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. I remember he was he thought that oh, the first one will never succeed, the second one will never succeed, and then he's like, That's... yeah, okay, I guess I guess I'll help you guys with the third one. It's fine. 
well, when he did that, when he did that lawsuit about uh, about unpaid mon about unpaid money. Um, oh yes, I do remember that, that. The thing is, CDPR had when they approached him, they gave him two options: either a, a percentage of the sales, or b, an upfront cost. But if you take b, you can't get a, can't get both of them. I do remember this absolutely, and he t he took the the lump sum, and then he later regretted it. He took the lump sum for the first game. Then when they made The Witcher 2, they approached him again about what about that same deal. And he's like, give me my money now and fuck off. Yep. Which is which is why oh, which is why he more or less had no case when he tried to argue that for the th for the third game after it had become a runaway hit. Yeah. And Glukowski had implied that the that um that the reason why he was pushing that was because of who really wore the pants in the house. Which was basically saying that his wife was probably pushing him to do that. Oh, interesting. Well, I mean, I'll be honest with with a wife myself. Usually, she has the better ideas than I do. So, I um, am not shocked that he went home and she's just like, "You what?" Though, though, um, if in the that being that being the case, I'm not sh I'm not sure if setting up a lawsuit years after the fact is. The sm is the smart idea. Oh, oh. <laughs> writers are not known for intelligent decisions. After all, we've gone into publishing where we get fucked with seven per seven percent royalties. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and speak speaking of that, while it isn't a apo a apocalypse, it leans close enough to that. Did you ever read Roadside Picnic? Yes, I am a uh, I'm a very big fan of. Oh, great! Now I can't remember their names. I've read like three of their books, uh, and now fuck, shit. whatever. Um, uh, yes, I love the the brothers Andre and Boris. I love Roadside Picnic. Uh, I definitely delved into Stalker. Hmm. My first standalone RPG that I worked on and I published through Exalted Funeral was uh, called Into the Zone. Which was very much a stalker Tarkov esque RPG, uh, high lethality. It was just meant for GMs to screw with their players and cause them absolute misery. I had a lot of great feedback from people. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, I suppose, I suppose, and I did, I did, um, I did check. It's um, I'm and I'm gonna, I'm gonna screw this up because I don't speak Russian. Um, Strugatsky. Strugatsky brothers, yes, yes. Oh, and the reason why the reason why I say it's bo it's border it's borderline is it's is um the zone the zone is just this isolated area. Not necess it's not necessarily a case of the whole, the whole world having go having gone through post nuclear fallout. Oh. No, it's a very localized apocalypse. Yeah. Um, it it's it's localized in the same sense that say District Nine was was localized. Yeah, no, that's that's a fair comparison. I would agree. And, um, and I'd also I'd also say that some that some cursed some parts of the cursed Earth can also be can also be prime research material when it comes to Judge Dredd. Then again, there's a lot you can take from Ju from Judge Dredd just from a few stories alone. <laughs> yeah, I, I will mention that uh, one of the major factions I took some inspiration from Judge Dredd in their uh, artistic and uh, uh, artistic design and in-game stats. Mm -hmm. So, with that, with that in with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to the the setup that you're doing, um. It is it is somewhat interesting to me that you you are styling this as a successor to Gamma World, and yet you're using a roll under D, roll under D twenty instead of the percentile die. Um, yeah. What prompted that? What prompted that shift? Um, I mean, a few reasons. Uh, I did experiment a lot with different dice systems. Originally, I was actually crafting a D twelve system, but after I realized that it would. Uh, a lot of the numbers would skew very heavily. I thought the D20 was a good place to be. Uh, I know that there's a lot of people that lambast the D20 as like, you know, it is a false god. I mean, I've said that 
before as well, so, you know, guilty as charged. But with, uh, again, uh, another major, one of the most major inspirations, AD, AD&D, it just makes sense that, like, a plus one means something, but not to the point where it's going to destroy all semblance of balance. And I did also take some inspiration from Dark Heresy and how they do their um, skills and whatnot. Not so much the D10s, but how you get degrees of success with, you know, the tens column. How many tens you are below the threshold of what you need to get inspires how many degrees of success. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to meld those two so that you could have a D20 system, which is easy to read and instantly, you know, success or failure. But I also wanted to add in a skill system where you can tangibly see yourself leveling up skills and going down different paths. And and, and so, like, it's not just a railroaded system of leveling up, like 5th edition is, let's be honest. It's it's a system where it's like, I got this many skill points. I want to dump it into this because I want to be good at stabbing people instead of shooting people or some other thing. Yeah. Though when it when it comes to skill systems, it's all it's just as important to make sure that there's not too many skills. That was a problem that a lot of developers struggled with in the '90s, and to a certain extent, the late '80s, where the skill li- the skill list would just get ridiculous. And I know I know yes. I know some will point will point at um sh- will point at Shadowrun, and Shadowrun has its um issues when it comes to excessively large skills. In fact, a good amount a good amount of those early Cyberpunk games do. But my whipping boy when it comes to that will always be stuff like Phoenix Command or any game that Fantasy Games Unlimited put out where the skip where the skill list is almost an entire page on a character sheet on its own. Wow, I didn't hear what I thought I was gonna hear. Uh I got two more for you. You played Rifts? Rifts has been my whipping boy for over twenty years. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you want to get into uh, parapsychology where you're going to have to go down the astronomy route, you know? Like, there's, like, what, 10,000 skills or something like that? Yeah. Even one of my uh, guilty pleasure games that I, I truly do love with a passion, which is Polaris, which is this French underwater RPG. I love it. But even I have to be, like, 57 skills, dude. Let's bump these down, you know? Yeah, the... There was there was this massive boner at, in the in the late eighties throughout the nineties for trying for trying to create these deta- for trying to create these um, detailed systems in the name of re- in the name of realism. And I wonder what caused up, that. Um, a lot of thi- a lot of things probably did, but I can't I can't really na- I can't really nail down any any one entry for the same reason I can't nail down. What one entry caused the shift to a unified resolution system instead of a bunch of subsystems? Mm. What it's the the what I like to call all roads lead to Rome, because if you look at the early purveyors in the TTRPG space, there's not really a unified um, die die resolution mechanic for when you're rolling die, but a series of situational ones. This yes. is an artifact of the wargaming days, where that was pre- were, was pretty much common. A difference, a different setup for shooting, a different setup for melee, a di- a different setup for magic in some in some fantasy ones, and so on. And different fa- different phases for e- for each of them. And much in this much in the same way that. Someone who, even if someone trains to catch with their right hand, they're but while they're a lefty, they're all they're always going to be a lefty. That sort of vestige carried over, oh. except in places like Japan, where the where the way TTRPGs evolved over there wasn't the same. But that's another. No, story. no, they they love Call of Cthulhu there. That is their number one. That's their D and D. Well, that's that's what I know for certain. D and D did have a footprint early on, but when I say early on, the only thing that re- that um, really had a footprint was, um, I think Beck Me era Redbox. Mm, because, yeah. No, what, I have to correct myself. It wasn't Beck Me. It was BX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And an attempt to translate A D and D was done, but the translation w- took a long time. Was very expensive, 
And by the time it finally came out, Tunnels and Trolls had come around and kind of stole its thunder. Mm -hmm. There's also the fact that a lot of I know I know a lot of a lot of people who call themselves old school turn up their nose at the at the um idea at the idea of taking from CRPGs as as inspiration. But over in Japan, that's kind of how it happened. Like the bit the one of the big one of the big early entries in Homegrown back in the late '80s was Wizardry. Wizardry got ad Wizardry was a big damn deal in Japan and got adapted into a um, TTRPG over there. Mm, makes sense. Oh. Although a lot of the old schoolers that are so you know purists in all their forms, um, you know, they're also the kind of people that can't seem to get away from. They're equally as bad as the as the people these days that are like, I can't play anything other than fifth edition. These are the same people that are like, if it's not BX, it might as well be dead to me. You know. Your, um, to I usually I, I usually I usually just laugh at them because <laughs> because because um, as Mark Twain supposedly said, against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. But. <laughs> The re the reason why the video why the video game purism thing always find always amuses me is it's like everyone conveniently forgot that TSR was just as involved in video games as they were in tabletop games, like everyone just forgot just forgot that the gold box games existed. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But no. now everyone has selective memory, right? Um, I like to call it convenient memory. And the first mm. time I the first time I started using that was. Right around the time of the Schumacher Batman movies, because people were talking themselves into believing that Batman was always this dark and serious character until Schumacher came along and mucked it up. And I'm like, did you guys for just forget about the Silver Age of comics? Did we forget about Adam West? Uh, which is which is based on the Dick Sprang era, which was in the Silver Age. <laughs> exactly. It all it all comes back. And. Even even as weird as the Adam West show was, the Silver Age of Comics is fucking bonkers. Yeah, I refuse yeah. to believe that people weren't on drugs in the writing room. Yeah, dude, it was the seventies and eighties. Of course, they were on drugs in the writing room. There are drugs in their sleep. Yeah, <laughs> but the other th now, obviously, the big the big Fallout thing to 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 note with with what you're doing with Earth After Death is the AP system. So is is it a case where you have a certain number of a, of AP for for each action and um using actions is going to cost AP before you even do the roll? Uh yes. Yeah. I mean it's it's very simplified. It's very just taken from Fallout and, and Wasteland in that regard. I, I tried to lean it more towards Wasteland because I think Wasteland two and three really refined how AP is presented and used in those games. Um, you know, depends on the weapon, depends on what you're doing. I want to be able to give enough freedom that someone can, you know, make their turn worth it instead of being like, you got three actions, you can only do one as an attack, you know? Or, you know, Pathfinder 2E as the, you can attack three times, we take subsequent negatives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just like, no, if someone wants to dump their ammo on, on turn one with every action, let them do it. You know, you can press an assault rifle into a wall and just hold down the trigger. You know, if, if you know, if military, uh, you know, Navy SEALs can do it, you know, these guys can do it. There, There is one. It's funny you mentioned Pathfinder 2nd Edition because there was one concept I remember seeing when I looked through the spell list that I thought was a very interesting idea that wasn't utilized enough. Which seems, which is par for the course when it comes to me and Paizo, finding mm. interesting ideas that that end up being underutilized, and that was how they handled this action economy when it came to certain spells. Now we all know we all know the usual spell comp the usual spell components, but a concept that they did to integrate it with that three action system was providing stronger effects or additional effects if you used more than one um, spell component. I.e., if sp oh. spell that might that a certain spells might require just say a somatic component, but if you also added a vocal and a and a item component, you could get you could get extra effects on it. You know, at add, adding that kind of risk reward to it. And I thought now that does was, that 
No, oh, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt. Continue. And only a handful of spells actually used it, which. But I thought it, I thought it was a really good way to kind of do to kind of do this risk reward system when it came to action economy. Does that translate also to every time you know you get three actions? If you spend two of your actions casting a spell, does that cor correlate directly to how many components you're utilizing? The idea was um, each component each component use was one action. Okay, yeah, okay, makes perfect sense. And then you spend all three actions, three components, beef it up. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. I like that. Unfortunate that it, it's only like, what would you say, twenty percent of the spells, twenty five percent of the spells? Yeah, which is which is odd given how Pathfinder and D and D three point five are the are the biggest offenders when it comes to having too many damn spells. Mm -hmm, per, mm -hmm. ver, versus um, core book. Hell, a story I've been told is that the reason why prestige classes were put in the D, were were first put in the DM's guide in D and D three point five was because they ran out of room in the player's handbook. I argue that they would have had room if they hadn't if they hadn't had so many spells that were redundant entries. Fair enough. Although they're probably picking and choosing from like you know, first edition, second edition, they're like, oh, let's keep this, but add this, and, you know, it's okay to trim, but, you know, again, well, those same purists don't want it. Do we really need 14 versions of protection from? Like, do we do, do we need a protection from for all nine alignments? If I remember correctly, in first edition, there was protection from good and evil, but, like, it was, like, protection from evil, but then you could switch to good. That's all you had. Well, that's all... If it's if it's doing the same thing just with a different target, all you need all you need is just protection. Yeah, so, I don't know. It's it's the same people that want to like get super granular and nitty gritty with their crunch to the point where you need uh, a bachelor's degree in order to make a, a worthwhile character, which is something but, I definitely tried to avoid. Let's uh, I, but enough but enough about Traveler Five. <laughs> Good, good lord! That thing reads like a like the owner's manual to your car that you don't read. <laughs> At least Mongoose fixed it. Mongoose's version is better. I wasn't keen. I wasn't keen on the second edition trying to combine combine the three, combine um the core materials into one book instead of splitting it into three. Because I think Traveler is a setting where you you can't do that in in one core book. No, but they tried. They what else can you say, right? They tried. Um, I'll, I'll give. I'll give them the gold star. I'll give them the gold star. But fair enough. <laughs> with, but with that in with that in mind, um, since you brought up since you brought up um, the whole thing with ammunition, that's one thing that a lot of people have tr have tried to have have tried to bring in, but it ends up being a bit um, fiddly. Because, mm -hmm. because of the, because of the notion of having to keep track of ind of individual bullets, which if when automatic weapons are brought into the picture, that's going to be a bit tricky to do. So how how do totally you agree. maintain that a ammunition management without getting too granular? I a f a friend of mine and my editor for most of my projects, Tristan uh, and I kind of co-developed it thanks in inspiration to the Chronicles World of Darkness style games with the power of dots. Um, we we took a more ambiguous approach, and I even say in the core book, um, I, I think in the updated version, where it's like, if you want to track 30 bullets plus one in the chamber, if you reload, play Arma, dude. Like, don't play this. But it's, you know, a, a gun will have an ammo, uh, a set, a max ammo of like if it's a pistol, probably four or five. And, like, that's not true to life, but, again, it's it's supposed to be ambiguous. You have, if you spend a bullet, you roll the associated dice. The more bullets you spend, the more dice you roll, but the more action points it takes. Eventually, you can get to, like, uh, like a minigun, where you can, you can dump all your ammo. You can roll 12 dice and mow down everyone in front of you, which is all fine and dandy, until you know you're out of bullets mm -hmm. um and i think with the dot system that we we implemented the ambiguous ammunition system we call it 
um, it prevents the concept of like numbers bloat where you don't have to have 30 bullets per magazine and then you have to track 180 and then blah, 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 blah. Like, no, the most, the max magazine size anything's going to get to is 12. So therefore, and that's for like heavy weapons. So it's like, okay, I got 30 bullets, Mm -hmm. you know, bam, that's like three magazines worth of stuff. And then, you know, bullets have value. You have to scavenge for them. You can craft them. But the point is, is that you have a manageable number instead of just an insane amount that you got to constantly track. And it also seems that you that um that you are you are putting some advantages and disadvantages if somebody wants to lean towards melee or lean towards um ranged weapons. Which yes, I do, appreciate, I, I, I do appreciate since in a lot of games that do have ranged weapons, there is um there isn't enough of there isn't enough of a reason to pick um melee. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean even like I'm in the middle of playing cyberpunk for the first time and as much as i want to swing a katana around and cut people up i'm like oh shit you know they're, they're gonna shoot me man like why the hell am i you know closing the distance and honestly the setting does more favors for me in that regard because like i i tell gms in in the manual the gm's manual i'm, I'm developing which is like make sure that they're always struggling like even when they got plenty of money and they can buy a ton of ammo like yeah things are good but just like every dungeon crawl is a test of managing resources, you're going to run low. And at that point, you don't need to reload a knife or a, or a sledgehammer. And so because it's in a post-apocalyptic setting, it's it lends to the fact that a gun is powerful, it's really useful, and then you're out of ammo. And then what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in mind, given the, given the fact that you're using a... Roll out a roll under D twenty. I'm curious if anyone's brought up the black hack to you. Yes, I do have a copy of the black hack. I think it's great. Mm-hmm. I have nothing but good things to say about it. Mm-hmm. Um, surprisingly, it was not inspired by that. Uh, I want to say that it's. Um, I mean, I have a science background. I call it convergent evolution, which is when two things develop the same. Uh, evolutionary advantage despite not being related to each other the reason birds and bugs have wings I stumbled upon a roll under d20 system thankfully but I was not the first to pioneer it by any means yeah I I had I had, fig- I had figured as as much um, <laughs> yeah but what I do find what I do find interesting is that some of the entries that you've li- that you've listed as as inspirations tend to go for a more freeform design and with in terms in terms of how um things work for advancement whereas you you do kind of have some some degree of archetypes like in the preview doc there was the black thumb yes so would it be would it be a case where where um where you are you, you are using something of an archetype system instead of it being full freeform? Yes, it's it's not as stringent as classes are known to be these days, but it's also not fully freeform because I've played a lot of very generic and quotations freeform uh, RPG systems and some work, some don't. I wanted to lean more towards the OSR and SR style of game where there are classes, but I didn't want it to be so um uh, confining or claustrophobic like the black thumb has special skills like the backgrounds have special skills that make them very unique in certain areas but by no means if you go down that route are you stuck using you know this gun or this melee weapon like you have advantages with certain things but you can build it however you want with enough time and ingenuity and and you know just paying attention to how you level up that's that's why I referred to it as archetype instead of class. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I think you. Yeah. I call it backgrounds. It's kind of similar to Troika in that way. Like it's backgrounds, not classes. But yeah. The the reason why I use archetype is, and the way I define it is, it's a case where it's a leaning, but it isn't. But it isn't an outright path. Um, Precisely. Another a, a another big example of this kind of thinking would be Rollmaster, which. Technically has cl- has classes, but it's more of 
every time you level up, you get a certain number of points to advance. Mm. But depending on your class, um, some things are going to be less expensive than others. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, very much like the early fallouts when you took your uh, tag skills. Um, every time you dumped a point into that, it would... Uh, like, like, if you dumped a point into a tag skill, it'd go by up by two instead of one, so you could really rock it right up. Um, that was currently used in the pre-release version of the game, mm -hmm. uh, for my game. Um, I realized very clearly after some play tests, it's like, wow, these guys are really good at shooting guns and nothing else. So I, I pulled that back and just gave it a flat big bonus so that you're good at something off the start instead of getting you know, logarithmically way better. Now, when it comes to advancing in skills, is there a is there a cap as far as how how many um, points could be put into a into a given skill at it at any one time? You know, which is that kind of thing is usually done to prevent people from dumping all of their points into one or two skills. Um, no, because I again another thing I've put into the GM's guide is. This game is meant to be broken. That won't keep them safe. Uh, an inspiration for that was uh, Caves of Cud, if you've played that. Which is, um, it, like, you can be overly broken. You can use certain abilities to give yourself, like, 100 in each stat when the max is 10. You'll still get beheaded. Like, it's not going to save you. Like, if you take five levels and put every single point into guns, and you're really good at shooting... It all it takes is one stray rocket, and you're done. So, whatever, you know? Level up, have fun, go crazy, it's not going to save you. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing that the abilities that are, that are present in backgrounds would be your answer to perks. Uh, no, not directly. Um, it's more akin to the class-based skills in AD&D and, and, and I believe early Gamma World. Um, perks are an additional system on top of that. If you want to get weird and uh, further diversify your character into weird and wacky ways. Mm -hmm. um, so that has lended itself from Fallout as well, where perks are there, you have advanced skills on there, you have regular skills. Someone once said, the more rules, the more freedom, counterintuitively. And I want to make sure that people have that option to really build and flourish and make their own thing with all of these options, but I don't want to overwhelm. Yeah. It, it is very much a pendulum. There's, there's been a lot of conversation that, se that, seems to evolve, that seems to delve into more rules means too restrictive, less rules means more, more freedom, and it's never that simple. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> It's be because um, well part part of the reason why f why fate for instance has been my whipping boy has been the fact that it's despite all the free form and all the mu must storytelling that its um, defenders will advocate for the issue is guidance like a big thing is the descriptor tags known as aspects but in terms of what's the dividing line between different types of aspects. And how and the dividing line between making sure that an aspect isn't too all encompassing. There's not a whole lot of guidance for players or G or GMs. And whenever I bring that up, somebody immediately gaslights me into, into saying, "Oh, you you just want everything spoon fed." No, I don't. You gotta <laughs> you have to understand you have to understand the limits before you can start um, pushing them. Mm -hmm. Is my, is my philosophy. Oh. Um, but it it does it does sound like there isn't there is an option to further customize beyond just background and um sk and skills and um race. Yeah, absolutely. Well, species uh, strain is what I call it. Mm -hmm. We want to move away from the R word because uh, you know everyone's weird about it. You um, know the people that are for the people that are against are always weird about. It. I'm just like fuck it. Give it another name. It's strain. It makes yep. sense. I I've I've talked about it I've talked about it before and the and the being weird about it is is ultimately pointless because because um like I, like I said somebody who's left-handed is always going to be left-handed um and the ter the terms going to the terms going to get used 
in in conversation regardless. So I'm not interested in in swimming up river. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. But um, it there was also mention that the overseer's manual would have rules for um, psionic acuity and cybernetics. Now, absolutely. With 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 um, psionics is that treated as a new type of skill, or is it treated uh, as a full background? Uh, no, it's treated as something that you can unlock um, uh, either through gameplay or if you get really, really lucky on... It's treated like Psionics from AD&D, &D, where like, if you get really lucky on your first level roll, where it has these certain conditions where it's like, if your intelligence and blah, blah, blah is above five, you get this percentage you know, chance to unlock it. Roll a D100 at character creation. If you started at level one, congrats, it's going to be wild. Um, and it's just meant to, it's based off of the control skill, which is an intelligence. Usually control is used for dealing with the traumas of uh, paranormal and psychological issues when it comes to like anomalies and horrifying imagery and shit that you, you know, walk upon like a raider encampment full of, you know, flayed bodies and stuff like that. But if you un go through that path, control is now your main stat for using your mind to blow people into chunks. Mm -hmm. So is it a... Is it a case where you where um using it can run the risk of a backlash? Absolutely. Um uh the the very basic version you can get in like uh in psychic mutations in the core book, which involved like cryokinesis, pyrokinesis. If you do damage to yourself, you can increase how powerful the uh, the uh the, the actual attack is. And it's very similar with some of the powers in there as well. Um, but I also tried to get really wacky with it. I just wanted people to be able to have fun and be like, oh, see what I can do with this. I can use, uh, what was it called? Um, uh, ego enhancement or something like that, where you can just immediately increase your, all of your physical stats by a certain number. And if you like stack it properly, you can just keep using that ability and get to stats up to 100 uh, and it's just insane, which you can't really do at low levels, but at high levels, you could do that. Again, it won't save you. <laughs> You'll still get steamrolled. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to cybernetics, a lot of a lot of games that have cybernetics, cybernetics will usually have some sort of co cost when it comes to putting them on, whether that whether that be the humanity. Um, not humanity, but essence in Shadowrun, the mm -hmm. the empathy rule in Cyberpunk, or even even just straight up how much them being more expensive. Um, yes. How do you plan on ha how do you plan on having cybernetics work for Earth AD? Uh, I was actually I thought this up years ago, and I recycled it from a very early version of the game. Mm -hmm where I was like, oh no, this was a good idea. Again, from my scientific background, I, I did um, biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one of my classes, I learned about, uh, I did microbiology, which I thought was one of the coolest classes I ever did. And so how it works is the interface between the cybernetics and the person using them is a certain specific bacteria, which basically enables communication from neuron to silicon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the more cybernetics you have, the more of a viral infection you have in yourself, which makes it more difficult to communicate with people and also harder to heal because your body is just infested with biofilms coating your stumps and removed limbs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as you get more cybernetically enhanced, you're more powerful. But again, you need to spend more time healing or you need to... You take a massive negative when it comes to dealing with uh, environmental damages, radiation, and trauma. Mm -hmm. Which certainly makes sense. Yes, now, absolutely. One of the other, one of the other things that's very much present in the in um, Fallout One and Two, as well as in New in New Vegas, which, as far as the first person ones, will always be the best. Um, is the presence of factions. And granted, mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the lesser fallouts also have that, but I just... But, um... Emil will, Emil will be my whipping boy as far as bad writing, so, I, so I'm not going to acknowledge the, the, the factions in, th in 3 or 4. 
but yeah, no. I mean, I got a soft spot for three. It got me into the series. Uh, I'm not keen on four's take on it. Um, oh. So yeah, <laughs> but the point is, is, is that there's always there's always been some sort of faction set up, and as I as I understand it, you you somewhat ha- you somewhat have that with things like the Lawbringers, the King's Knights, and the we- the Weepers, and and so on. Yes. Now, in the Overseer's Manual, I'm, I'm guessing that you're gonna, that they're going to get a, a a good amount of exposure explaining what they are, what their goals are, and who, who they like and don't like. Yes, yeah. There's going to be nice full-page spreads with art as well as explaining their goals, what they do, what their history is. It's got, I got their individual stat blocks for mm-hmm. enemies and what their abilities are, where they're usually found. Um, I even have a faction system which will be I'm I'm working on a third slash fourth page, like double sided page for the character sheet of like, this is your basic. And if you want to go in depth, you can get this one, which has, you know, one side is cybernetics or psionics. You flip it over and it's got a faction system. And the faction system is as you interact with these factions and do good things and bad things, you will gain boons and stains, which will fluctuate their reputation with you. As reputation goes up, they like you more. As reputation goes down, they'll hunt you more. Mm-hmm. And of course, they're all interconnected, so helping one will positively or negatively impact others. So there is a push and pull of like, yes, this is a post-apocalyptic wasteland, but at the same time, just as the early fallouts did, civilization comes back, and the factions are a way of showing that this incipient new civilization, this these factions are going to be omnipresent. You're going to have to deal with them, and it's definitely up to the GM, the overseer, to uh, make sure that their presence is known in every one of the games. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> obviously, obviously, there's been, there have been some in, have been some interesting ones. The I th- I think for a lot of people who are fans of Fallout, the the faction that ended up becoming something of a fan f- fan favorite in one form or another was the Brotherhood, who've um even even though even though later entries have kind of missed kind of missed the point in my opinion about what the brotherhood's supposed to be there's always been that um technophile aspect to them yes and when i see a name like the like the king's knights i'm cu- i'm curious if the brotherhood was an, is an inspiration for that faction or if i'm uh or if i'm not on the mark on that uh, funny enough, no, not at all. The if anything is closest to the Brotherhood, it's Marigo, which is the former old world governments that cryogenically froze themselves and basically waited out the apocalypse. And that they're small and mighty, but they have like advanced technology. They got thirty foot Titanfall robots. They got APCs and stuff. But the King's Knights was actually inspired by one of my favorite novels, which is Swan Song, um, in which, long story short. There's uh, this general that ran this doomsday bunker under a mountain. When the nukes dropped, unfortunately, the tremors caused the mountain to collapse, and the only two people walking out of there were the general and this um, this psychopathic kid that survived and was clearly nuts after that. And so he always referred to the general as the king, and he had a video game that he wanted to play before the apocalypse called King's Night. And so after that, I was just like, Oh yeah, that's a cool name. And so they are the King's Knights. They follow the King. Is there like a pseudo feudal system? Yes, but they're more nuanced than just being like, oh yeah, we're you know a apocalyptic take on medieval whatever. I I, I want to make it thematically appropriate to the book as well as this setting that I'm creating. Yeah, and when it comes to the when it comes to the Lawbringers, I get the feeling that they they see that they see themselves somewhat somewhat similar to like like say the Mar- like say marshals were in the old west would that be accurate hello hello oh dang it happened again hold on sorry about that discord decided to forget my mic was plugged in all good um i was t- i was saying about the law about the lawbringers just from the name alone i keep I could I could bring up dread when it comes to that because that's the name of the um, firearm that judges have, but I get the feeling that they're more akin to 
a wasteland version of U.S. Marshals. Yes, very. They're very wasteland. The the wasteland marshals inspired a little bit of Judge Dredd inspired, but mm -hmm. I really liked Wasteland Two, Wasteland Three. The marshals were like, you know, truck motorcycle riding fellows that are trying to bring law to the lawless waste. That's uh, very you know one to one inspiration there. Mm -hmm. And since you've brought since you brought up Mad Max as part of the inspirations. Every Mad Max movie has ended with some sort of big, big ass vehicle segment, and I'm curious within the rule set for Earth After Death if you have some rules for chases, because inevitably somebody's going to want to try and replicate that. Absolutely, we absolutely do have rules for chases. I have a full on, um, uh, actually inspired by Mothership. They have like a little map for like, oh, not Mothership, sorry, the Alien RPG. The Alien RPG has, like, a whole map for you to put little spaceships on, and there's little zones. Like, as they pass by, they can do this kind of damage. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to that, where it's just, it's it's six squares, top to bottom. You place the cars, depending on their speed, into whatever little zone that they go. And then you can move up and down, left and right. You can, you know, bash into people that are in the same zone as you. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. The chase... Chase rules were number one on the list of things you had to include because, you know, if you don't have a good Mad Max-esque chase, then what the hell are you doing with an apocalyptic game? Yeah. But but uh, with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as the page count for the Overseer's Manual and Wastelander's Handbook? Uh, Wastelander's Handbook is coming in at 30 pages... 56, but if we hit that stretch goal, I hope, uh, 60. The Overseer's Manual is going to sit probably comfortably around 140, 150. Not too long, but just long enough to have everything. Mm -hmm. Goldilocks length, essentially. Goldilocks length. Long enough to have everything you need, but not long enough that you're like, oh my god, it never ends. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know that there is also the um, zine, but I don't see I don't see that being more than twenty pages. Because well uh, the Apocalyptic Dreams Adventure Zine? Yeah. Oh, it's gonna be around I'd say in, in high forties, low fifties to include absolutely everything. I have uh I got Luke Gearing to do a point crawl for that, which read reads wonderfully. Thank, thank you, Luke Gearing. And I have a, a friend in the space, Josh Domanski, who's working on another one. And then me and my friend are working on a large hex crawl. or Yeah, hex crawl essentially for the city to uh, explore and whatnot. So I want to make sure that it's packed with enough content that someone can flip through and you know pick and choose. But again, Goldilocks length with that as well. Mm -hmm. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Oh. Not uh, a date, per se, but just a ballpark. I mean, if crowdfunding goes well, my distributor with RV Games is absolutely wonderful. She's very efficient. She gets really good numbers, and like we get stuff out the door. My first Kickstarter, we got it, we got it out a month early, uh, which is unheard of. I'm hoping, I want to give myself a conservative uh, estimate that December is when things will be rolling out the door early December, just before the Christmas rush. Um, if it's early, great. And if it's a bit later, then also fine, because I don't want it to push into, like, Q2 of 2025. I, I, I think a three-month window from December 2024 is a reasonable time to release what we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. And... I will certainly be keeping an eye out for it, as I keep an eye on just about everything. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you <clears throat> for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, 
My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.